All right, guys, in this unit, we're going to start looking at the organization piece of our data to help make things a little more manageable for us. We're going to organize it. We're going to present it using some graphs and charts. So we're going to start today. Section 2, one, it talks about organizing. If you have what's called raw data, and there's room in the very upper left-hand box on your handout, if you are given what is called raw data, that's data in original form. So that's what I gave you. I printed out the survey data from what you guys took on my website. I printed out the survey data for you. That is raw data. I have not organized it in any way, shape, or form. That's just how the results came in from my survey. So raw data is absolute original. You've done nothing to it but collect it. That's all. What we're going to be spending our time on today, we're going to look at frequency distributions. What they help us do is organize our raw data and it uses classes and frequencies, so it helps us organize our raw data. So instead of looking at a list of, I think the one survey I had 54 responses, instead of having to look through that whole list and try to make some conclusions about our data, our frequency distribution is going to help us organize it and make it much more manageable. So if we want to make a graphical representation, we could, or do other forms of analysis like mean, median, mode, things like that. It can make it a lot easier for us. We said that a frequency distribution uses classes. What a class is, it could be a quantitative, so again quantitative, quantity, one of our terms from our first unit, quantity, so numerical classes, or qualitative, so just some kind of quality or characteristic, and those are just the categories we're going to place our raw data into. The frequency is just however many data values happen to fall into each of those classes. So frequency is how many data values belong in each class when we start to sort. And the first type of frequency distribution we're going to look at is called the categorical frequency distribution. That's going to be for our qualitative data. So data that we can put in specific categories. So it could be our nominal data, nominal data or our ordinal data. If you want to throw in there that it's qualitative as well, that's what we're looking at for the categorical one. What we have on our sheet, we have a nice little table set up for us for a categorical frequency distribution. Now, we did two surveys. You have two sets of data in front of you. You have uh, the favorite lunch out of the four choices that I gave you, and then you have the travel time it takes you to get to school. All right, so which data are we going to use for a categorical frequency distribution? Our lunches or the time to get to school? It's going to be our lunches. Lunches would be a nominal level measurement. It's also a qualitative variable. So it would be our lunches. So our different classes, we would have chicken strips. Chicken strips, we have taco salad. Spaghetti. I think I spelled that right. It's one of those words I never seem to get right. And we have orange chicken. So now the idea is what this categorical frequency distribution helps us do is it helps us take this list and make it more organized so I know how many people respond to chicken strips, taco salad, and then I can do other things with that information instead of having to stare at this big daunting list. So I want you to take some time to do, and if you and your partner want to help each other out, if one of you just wants to read off each one, tally them up. So the easiest way to do it, guys, so the first one I see is chicken strips. I'm going to put a tally. I do not recommend just trying to go through and count all the chicken strips. 
because chances are you're going to miss one. That's why I made the tally column. So maybe your partner just reads off to you and you just tally and then you can copy the other person's. So let's take a minute and tally them up. Another piece besides just totaling up our frequencies for each one. So we had 16 chicken strips, 22 taco salad, 9 spaghetti, and 16 orange chicken. And as I walked around, I saw some people, I think we need a little refresher on tallies. Remember, when you hit five, do that slash from left to right. It just makes counting a lot faster. Instead of having to count each individual one, you've got that group with the slash. You know it's a five. So you can count by fives instead of ones. Just a reminder. So another piece is we want to be able to find the percent that each of our different classes represents for our data set. So, I mean, it's meaningful to say, yep, 16 people like chicken strips best. But I think for most people, they relate better to percents. So how would I find what percent of people surveyed like the chicken strips the best? What do you think? OK, so frequency divided by the total. He said the total was 63. OK, I'm going to make that little note right here for us. 63 total, okay, so 16 out of 63, and then we have to take that and multiply by 100, and I know most of you like Miss Galley, I know I just slide that decimal over, but just a refresher, I know it's probably been a while since some of us have found percents, and let's go ahead and let's just round that percent, let's go nearest tenth, so approximately 25.4%. Go ahead and finish off finding the other ones. Let's go ahead again, round to the nearest tenths, please. And make sure, since these are not exact values, that we're using that squiggly looking equal for approximately. Now, what should our total for the percents be? It should be 100. In ours, I got 100. Now, sometimes due to rounding, can that be maybe like 100.1? Yeah, it can be. It might be a little bit off just because we're rounding. But it shouldn't be off. It shouldn't be like 105% or anything extreme like that. It should be very close, like within a tenth. It should be. Or if you round to hundredths, whatever the case may be. So that, ladies and gentlemen, in a nutshell, is a categorical frequency distribution. Now, let's get into a type where... We're going to use our quantitative data, so we're dealing with numbers, and that is known as a grouped frequency distribution. I can't remember if I typed that definition out for you or not. I know I filled in most of that second box for you. A group frequency distribution, we're going to use that when your range of data is large. So in order to deal with large amounts of data, we're looking at our drive time survey. I don't want to have to try to make a separate class where we have somebody that took two minutes to get to school, and I'm just looking through here, and somebody that took 60 minutes to get to school. I don't want to have to list out one through 60, or two through 60. That's going to be way too tedious to do. We're going to have a huge, huge table. So instead, when our data range is larger like that, we're going to make classes. So we're going to have intervals of values for each class instead of just 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to 60. We don't want to do that. So what I've done, just to make sure we have the process down, the rest of this information should be filled in for you on your sheet, yes? It's already filled in for you. So I, what I want to spend our time today doing is actually going through that process. 
because I'll be very honest, probably of anything we do in chapter two, this is probably come test time where I see the most mistakes is with this type of frequency distribution. There are a lot of steps there, there are, but with practice, guys, it's like they become like second nature. You're going to know what to do and when to do it. So if we take a look, first of all, step one says determine our classes. Find the highest and lowest value. So take a minute, look through your drive time data. Find your highest and lowest value. All right, so our highest value was 60. Our lowest was 2. The next piece, it says to find the range. It's nothing we have explicitly talked about in here, but I know probably at some point in middle school, you probably found the range of a data set. Does anybody remember what that is? How do you find it? You take the largest, subtract the smallest. So the range is 60 minus 2. So our range is 58. If you need to make another note to yourself there how to specifically find that range, make an extra note if you need to. Select the number of classes desired. You want to try to ensure the class width is odd. And we do have the stipulation, we're just limited, we want to keep it between 5 and 20 classes. Once you get beyond 20, it's like, eh, this is just getting way too big to manage. In less than 5, it's not really giving us a true picture of how the data is distributed if we go smaller than 5. So let's do, let's do 7 classes. And I know as soon as I say 7 classes, I know some of you are thinking, so uh, Miss Golly, then how do I know how to pick that? Is there a special formula? Is there? No, there's not. Your practice questions, you will be told how many classes when it comes to test time. I will tell you how many to use. You don't have to try to guess, and there's no special formula for it. You as a researcher decide, okay? All right, so it says to find the width by dividing the range by the number of classes. So my range was 58. Number of classes was 7. And we get roughly 8 point, I'm going to go with 3. Here's the deal, though, and this is going to be a little bit different for you. You see the word round. It says divide the range by the number of classes in round. And I don't know if you want to underline this. If you want to highlight it, you have to round up, not off. Does anybody know the difference? If I round off 8.3, what would I round it to? I'd round it to 8, right? Anything less than 5 goes down. Now, if I say to round up, though, what am I going to round 8.3 to? We're going to round it to 9. So it goes up to that next whole number. So even if I had 8.015, it would still round up, not off. It's probably one of the biggest mistakes people make when they're creating a group frequency distribution. You round everything up. No matter how small that number is after the decimal point, round up. All right, it says select a starting point, usually the lowest value, or any convenient number less than the lowest value. So I do like to start with whatever the lowest value is. So our lowest value is 2. So I'm going to go ahead and put a 2 and underneath my class limits. Now our class limits, the reason why it's not just a simple class, it's class limits because we're going to have an interval of values. So we selected our starting point, add the width to get the lower limits. Be very careful. This is the area. This is the area, come test time, that I always see the most mistakes on. I don't do 2 plus 9 and write it here. Whoops, 2 plus 9 is 11. There we go. Because my class width is 9, which means my width, my class, should only contain 9 values. If I do 2 to 11, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, how many values are in there? There's 10. So we don't add across. We add down. So 11, 11 plus 9 is 20. 20 plus 9 is 29. 29 plus 9, 38. 38 plus 9, 47. 47 plus 9, 56. 
So you add going down. If you add across, if I do 2 plus 9 and I put it across, now my width is too big. I'd add 10 values in there instead of 9. My width is too big. So now to actually get those upper limits, so the highest value in each of our limits, now we just subtract one off. So it would be 2 to 10 would be in our range. 11 to 19. 20 to 28. We have 37. And the cool thing is, guys, the pattern still holds true going down those upper limits. So you're just adding 9 each time if you want to do it that way. You sure can. Especially when you get to the last, we're like, ooh, how do I get that last upper limit? Add 9. 55 plus 9. 64. So again, be very careful. Whatever your class width is, that's how many whole number values are in your range. So if my width is 9 and my first limit is 2 to 10, you can only have 9 values in there. Okay, so be very, very careful. I know 10 minus 2 is 8, but I also have to include the 2 in there. So there's actually 9 values. Now for class boundaries, for class boundaries, most of, you show, most of you guys showed me on your test, you're okay with finding boundaries. So what we want to do, if our lower limit's 2, this is where we want to do our minus, in this case it would be minus a half, and then on the upper end we would add our half. So our boundaries would be 1.5 to 10.5. Your class limits cannot overlap, but your boundaries will. So keep in mind what our boundaries mean. So if I have boundaries from 1.5 to 10.5, that means for that class, 1.5 is included, 10.5 is not. It's just like when we found boundaries last unit. 1.5 is included, 10.5 is not. It's up to 10.5. 10.5 then is included in the next one down. So for our next one, we'd have any data values 10 and a half up to but not including 19 and a half. So we're finding boundaries. We're still keeping them very true to what we did in that first chapter. So go ahead and finish off your boundaries. Boundaries will overlap. Limits will not. While well, they appear to overlap, but we don't include that upper boundary. Oops. 55.5. There we go. There we go. So now here's our job. Here's our job. You can go through your data list and then try to place each value where it should with a tally. Here's another suggestion I have for you, something I want to show you today, and I'd like to take the time to do this because it can make your life a lot easier for a lot of the things we do in this chapter. If you have your graphing calculator with, please take it out. Entering data into lists is something that is going to make your life easier in here on many, many occasions. So dealing with our first data set, I want to take some time today and show you how to enter data values into a list. And then this awesome calculator will also sort them for you. So if you've never done this before, if you want to, jot these notes down on your little sheet if you want to, if you've got some space somewhere, maybe off in a margin. I think I took up a lot of the space. If you have some space, we go and we press the stat key. We're going to be very familiar with that key this year. And we just want edit. Now a few things with the list. I'm going to go with list one. Be very careful on the buttons you press. If you press delete and enter while your list name is highlighted, that whole list is going to be gone. The L1 and everything disappears. A lot of people have lists disappear on them. If I just want to clear out what's in that list so I can enter new things in. 
I highlight the list name, which is L1. I press clear and I press enter. If you're missing one of your lists, just do list two or list three, whatever you have. I can help you fix your list later. But again, if you put, if you highlight the list name and hit delete, it's going to take out your whole list. List one will be gone. If you just want to clear out the info, press clear when you're highlighted. So now I know it'll take a little bit of time, but again, maybe just partner up and read the values off. Enter the drive time values into your calculator so I can show you that it can help you sort them as well. So maybe just read to one partner and then just look off one calculator. It's not going to be... Here's a couple of cool things, what this will show you. If you need your total number of data values, it's given to you in the parentheses if you highlight the last value in your list. Are there 55? Yeah. I'm hoping. Maybe I missed one. I have 55 and 56. Make sure it's highlighted on the 10, not the square below it. All right. So here's the other cool thing what we can do. We can, if we go back to our home screen, second quit, you can go to stat. And then there's two sort options. Sort A means it's going to sort ascending, so it's going to start at the lowest and work its way to its highest. That's typically what you want. Sort D is descending, so it's going to start your highest value, put that in slot 1, and then work, it, work your way lower. What I'm going to do is pick option 2, and then you have to tell it what list you want it to sort. We have more than one list. So to get the lists, press your second key, and if you notice, above the 1 key, there's an L1. Or maybe your L1 wasn't there and you need L2, so you're going to want to push 2. So if you look above the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, you see an L with that same number. That gives you your list. If you hit enter, you're just going to get a done on your screen. To actually see it sorted, you've got to go back to stat and edit. Now what this helps us do is it makes placing those values in our classes a lot easier. Because now I know my first class... My first class is 2 through 10. So now I just look at my calculator and I can count all the way up to I hit if there's an 11 or a 12, whatever is my biggest one past 10. So take a minute and count up how many values you have for each of those classes. The last thing we need to do, and this is just to help us prepare for some of our different distribution, or excuse me, some of our graphical representations are going to have. In some instances, when you're representing your data, we want what's called a cumulative frequency. What does cumulative mean? Like it builds up. It builds up. If I give you a cumulative final, it's over everything we did, start to end. Okay? So now, when you do, though, when you do your cumulative frequency, you're going to use your class boundaries and if you're looking like Miss Golly but there's there's an extra row we only have seven classes there's eight rows for us to fill in because the first one the first one we're going to have anything less than our first lower boundary, which is one and a half. Anything less than one and a half. You might be thinking, Miss Golly, but yet there's nothing less than one and a half. You're right. Because the first entry you're going to have for cumulative frequency is you're going to start at ground zero. That's always going to be your first entry. So less than whatever your lowest boundary is. Then from there, you just continue entering all of your upper boundaries. So you're going to use your lowest boundary and then all of your uppers. But you need each time, and if you want to just do some quotation marks, I'm okay with it for now. Oh, I already have the less than on yours? Oh, I was nice to you. Awesome. Okay, so you guys already have the less than. So anything less than 10 and a half, 
There's 34 of those. Anything less than 19 and a half. Now I have to add, add 12 on. There's more than just 12 values less than 19 and a half. There's going to be 46 of them. So you keep going. I'm just going to do little quotes up here since you guys have it on your sheet. 52, we add on the 6. We add on 1. We add on 1. Now the one thing I want to make sure I point out, because I typically... There we go. And then we add another one on. The thing I want to make sure I'm very clear on day one with these, you cannot skip a class simply because there's a zero frequency. So if I create this, we had one with zero frequency right here, I can't just cut that out of my distribution. I can't just not count it because it's a zero. That's going to goof up what your distribution looks like when we start making this more visual in the next few classes. So just be very careful. You can't skip a class just because it has a frequency of zero. Okay.